Hi everyone, I'm Tim Torres, and this is the best damn video game podcast ever on 2DX.com, and today... Ever, ever, and ever. <laughs> oh, this is... Did I interrupt you? I'm sorry. No, no, this is perfect. It's just me and a special guest who has already introduced himself in a way. Uh, would you like to take Hardly. it away? Who are you? My name is Anthony Chow. I am a PR director here at Reverb Communications. Uh, I have been affiliated with the video game industry for a number of years. Um, started off testing games, then I was an editor for a good, a good chunk of my life. Unfortunately, no, I'm kidding. And um, I've been doing PR, a video game PR, for the past I want to say seven, eight years now. So yeah, so. So I'm a I'm a, a veteran of this industry, if you want to call it that. But um, so by, and I know my way around the industry a little bit, a little bit. So yeah. So thank you for having me on, Tim. Oh, thank you for being here. I mean, thank you for coming on. And by the way, by the way, I saw that list of the the top nine fighting games of all time. How dare you leave off Street Fighter Alpha Three? Well, were there any on that list you agreed with? Garou, Mark of the Wolves. Uh... No, that was a great pick cuz not many people know not many people not not many of the kiddies remember uh well first not many kiddies you know remember the the glory days of SNK and fewer or far between even remember Garu Mark of the Wolves. That game was brilliant. That was I mean not just animation wise and the look but also the fighting system was was pretty was pretty damn good. So um, yeah, that was that was a that was a nice insider pick. I I I gave you props for that. But the fact that you left off Alpha 3 was was a little was mildly was mildly disappointing. Well, between you and me, I thought maybe the original Street Fighter Two should have had a, a spot as well. You know. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I had this discussion many years ago. Um, I'm not sure how you got how familiar you are with the fighting, the 2D fighting scene, but um, James Chen, also known on the internet as the Chenzer, he's a fighting guru of, of of, and he's been in these tournaments, and he's actually a big promoter of these kind of uh, fighting tournaments. And uh, we had this long-term discussion about what was the best street fighting game of all time. And we came down to either it was, and this was after after Third Strike came out too as well. So it was either Alpha 3 or Hyper Fighting. And we liked Hyper Fighting because it, the simplicity of it, what, you know, the system, it was just a very simple game, but it was deep enough and the simple mechanics, you know, you can master. And it was very, once you got all the characters, it was probably a very well-balanced fighting game. And then on the opposite spectrum, that was Alpha 3, where you had, like, alpha combos and counters and, you know, all this crazy stuff that, was, that wasn't up to the level of, like, you know, Marvel versus Capcom. But it was, it was crazy and zany enough that was, but yet yeah, technically fundamentally sound enough that, it, you know, it, you, you can enjoy it. Those are the kind of the two extremes of the, of the, the Street Fighter Two ser- the Street Fighter Two series that we thought of were like the best. So, um, so yeah, I I, uh, I think you did include well, you did include a street, uh, was it Third Strike? Was it? I think so. I, I think so. I should yeah. know, but offhand, I I believe so. I had a World Tour mode yeah. too, right? Alpha Three. What's that? World Tour. There was like this robust. R- yes. almost RPG Alpha, style single player. Alpha 2 was, was a little... There are a couple characters I remember, if I remember correctly, were way overpowered in Alpha 2. I think, like, Dawson was really overpowered in Alpha 2. And they bounced that out a little, much better in Alpha 3. Um, yeah, now I'm sounding like a total street fighting <laughs> geek. Jeez. That's I perfect. go back in those days, so yeah. So yeah, those are my those are my heydays. So, um, so yeah. Um, anyways, I didn't want to, you know, make an exclamation or interrupt because, you know, but how dare you leave Alpha 3 off that list? So. Well, let's let's move on to um, the games you're working on. You're oh working yes, on. yes, of, of course. Uh, well, yes. Yeah. Let's talk about my. Let's talk about me. Can, can we talk <laughs> about me? Let's talk about me more. Okay. Please, um, please. No, uh, I'm I'm currently working on two indie titles. Uh, one is out. One is not out. Um, one of the titles I'm working on is Insurgency, which is a very cool um, kind of a throwback to like the if you're into first-person shooters. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, you're probably suffering, a lot of fans nowadays are probably suffering from first-person shooter fatigue with mm. Call of Duty, Ghost, and, the, and, and, you know, and the kind of, I wouldn't say debacle, but, like, the disappointments of Battlefield Online and all, like, all the troubles they're having online. So what's cool about Insurgency, it, it takes a kind of a throwback to the days of, like, Ghost Recon Rainbow Six, so it's... I mean, you get hit by two shots, you're dead. I mean, it's all about tactical play. It's gritty. 
urban combat, and they the, the developers, New World Interactive, did a fan, fan, fantabulous, that's a word, a fantabulous job of like really creating a sensation of suspense of that like death lurks at every corner and you better rely on communication and you can't go you're you know if you if you want to play the hero you're going you're pretty much going to die because you have to play and it, it really forces the player to play their roles as support or as a sniper or as a scout and you know it's and the and the way the game is designed in terms of objectives it's objective based tactical play is is really compelling and i think it speaks to I mean we launched the game two weeks ago two weeks ago and it speaks to the su- the success of the game it's in it's still in the top ten one in the top ten Steam seller so it's there's it 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 it's really cool seeing that people love this game and it's gratifying for the developers to know that there's still a market for this type of game you know there's it's not all about over the top first person shooters it's you can get real technical real like real like a realistic a real realistic what a that's a mm. terrible way to describe it, but you get truly realistic with, you know, with the gameplay, and it's 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 really it's really compelling. It's really nice to see that people still want to see a game like this. You mentioned uh, it gets it's more technical. It mentioned you mentioned that uh, you get you get killed in, in more than two in two or three shots. What else mechanically separates it from the battlefields and the Call of Duties or even Counter Strike, which I which I think personally just visually it looks the most similar to. Is, is it that is, fair to say? Well, because the game itself is based on the Source Engine. So it's you know it's gonna look as good as a Counter Strike Source Engine game. Um, I think what's cool about it is even though it's you know we we tout you know we tout how realistic it is and how the the guns when you fire them it feels like a real gun. It doesn't feel like some kind of pea shooter. It feels like when you're holding an AK-47, you can feel the recoil and you know and and the sway and and the sway of the weapon depending on your movement is affected in your aim, but you know, even though it's very realistic that way, there's also a lot of kind of I wouldn't say unrealistic, but there's gameplay modes where you know you're, you're reinf- you know you get reinforcements and waves based on how if you if you complete an objective. So, for example, if you're you know if you you're, you're playing in a you're playing in a squad and you're trying to get this objective, you're trying to capture this objective, and all of your teammates are killed off and you're last man standing, they can't respond until you get that objective. So once you get that that objective, they'll all respawn, and it's, and that in itself is unrealistic, but it's a cool gameplay mechanic because it causes this very suspenseful, like, is he gonna make it? You want to root for your teammate kind of kind of atmosphere. That's that's very appealing, and I and it's it's shown like people love this game. People, you go on the Steam page for this game, and the the user reviews are like, this game is so awesome. I didn't know I I never knew I wanted this. We get a lot of comments uh, that. I never knew I wanted this. You know, wanted a first-person shooter like this until I played it, and it's, you know, it's cool. It's really cool. To, and the team isn't done. The team is still developing, you know, making fixes. Um, we actually had a meeting today, and one of the bigger issues right now is the um, hackers are getting on, and they're kind of trying, and they're trying to imitate that. They're, they're trying to, they're hacking on, and they're and they're hacking on as the developers. So people see the developers online, and it's not really them. Yeah, it's oh, no. really. It's really, it's really, it's a little crazy. You think they'd be hacking on to like, you know, have aim bots or you know maybe crash a server, but they're actually some of these guys are hacking on to kind of mimic the developers, which is strange. So, um, so yeah, so the team's not done. They're going to be do, doing a lot of updates to the game, and so far it's, it's cool. It's it's really cool to see that this type of first person shooter is something that people want to play, which I think is really gratifying to the team. Can you talk more about the gameplay itself? Is it is it class based? When when the game begins and you get the loadout, can you choose like soldier or or medic? Yeah, or anything depending. Like that? Yeah, there's there's three there's three kind of basic classes, and then if you want to call it that, and then each class has like a, a specialization, you know, engineer, support, um, sniper, and whatnot. And the and it's really about you know what what weapons and loadouts are preferred, um, and and also what kind of you know what kind of armor you're wearing and what kind of grenades and whatnot, and then you have you know supply points as well. Each each depending on depending on how well you do, um, you get awarded some more supply points so you can upgrade your you know your weapons. You could you could put a muzzle, a silencer on one. You could put like a, a grip off you know a, a barrel grip on another to stabilize your aiming. Um, so it's it's. It's cool, and what's great is also is you can't. It limits the number of kind of specializations you have. You can't have like five snipers. 
<laughs> you have to once someone picks a Good. sniper class, you have to pick something else. So, in a way, that limits the players in, this, in a certain sense, but it also puts you in different roles. And 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 you and and if you allow yourself to play the role and and enjoy the tactical support and enjoy the tactical play, it's a very compelling experience. So there's nothing like um, in Call of Duty where you could call in air support, air strikes, or anything like that. No, no there's no kill streaks. <laughs> there's there's nothing. Uh, the one thing that the developers have been talking about is, and they do think it's kind of it's cool, is they want to add a com- kind of some kind of persistence, like a level up system or ranking system. They haven't figured out exactly how they're going to add it in. They do want to add something like that, but they don't want to go super over the top because to them it's all about the gameplay. It's all about communicating with your teammates and 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 you know it's it's you know backing them up and and figuring out different ways to get the objective and it's cool it's 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 like i say it's it's what's great about it is from a design standpoint the player is given everything they have right from the get go so there's not like you don't get you know you don't get armor you don't necessarily get like i mean you get armor upgrades you know through supply points but other than that you're not picking up like you know bazookas in the streets. You're not. There's no. There's no ammo crates that you shoot to get power ups. You start with what you. You know. You get what you get, and it's all about the skill and the communication between your teams. And and I think that's cool. I think that's really cool. What kind of objectives do uh, players have to accomplish? Like defuse the bomb or rescue hostages? Uh, the, the most simple one is just like uh, you. You you um you you go to a you basically. The most simple one is you, you go to a ter- you know you go to a, a, a territory and you basically get that ter- you, you get that territory and you just kind of sit there and wait for you know for you to occupy that ter- territory. Um, there's also like um, search and destroy missions where you're destroying you know ammunition caches. Um, the one the the cooler one and it's not ter- terribly original but it's it's VIP where you're escorting one player a live player and you have to escort them from one point to to the other. And what's interesting is the VIP. I mean, it's called VIP mode, and the VIP he doesn't have. He has all he has is a silencer, and a, a, a handgun with, with a silencer, and that's it. So you can easily tell who the VIP is, and it's actually quite interesting how how like um, you know you can the strategies that evolve and the tactics that evolve. Like you send like maybe you'll send like a, like the majority of your group in VIP mode to to the main to the main enemy. Thinking that's that that's the kind of that's where the VIP is, and then you have like a two-man team, the VIP and an escort, sneak around, you know, sneak around around the you know, and around and around to the um to the objective. So it's cool. It's really there's a lot, there's there's and there's more modes for that. You know, the team is again, like I said, the team's not done. They want to add more modes, but they also want to add the right modes. They don't want to uh, they, they don't want to go overboard. Um, they want to make sure that the gameplay is what they want it to be. Can you talk more about the uh, the, the uh, developers? Who are these guys, and how did they come about? Uh, They're a bunch of schmoes, for all I, for all I know. <laughs> no, um, um, the Jeremy Blum is the is 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 the um, come as the lead game director, the game director, and the founder of New World Interactive. He started on the he was he um he's been on the mod scene for many years, and he along with Andrew Spearin, who is the game designer, community manager. They're kind of the main two guys um, that really spearheaded um, Insurgency um, and New World Interactive, for that matter. Um, they've been working together on and off for close to ten years. And what's most interesting is they've only met in person once. <laughs> they've only oh, wow. met in person once, and they've been working on different mods for the Counter Strike, Red, Or- Red Orchestra, um, and other stuff. And it's it's cool that they've only met once in person. It's kind of the, the power of the internet. It's kind of interesting. So. <laughs> And it's actually this is they're going they're both going to indicate east in your neck of the woods um, two weeks from now. And this will be the second time they've been they've met. So, um, so yeah, they um, they're they're two cool two cool kids and living the dream. They're um, they're young developers and you know they got a really snazzy cool kind of uncool title that's gaining a lot of attention and it's getting a lot of people playing. So yeah. So you said they were working on this game for ten years. No, no, no. Well, no, they've been doing different mods and different other games. I mean, this is the game they wanted to make when they first got together. But in terms of actually, you know, plan, you know, the, the actual development of this game, I want to say this game has been in development for on and off two years. So, and it's 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 a very interesting story they are, they have because they wanted they they had they started Kickstarter that didn't work out. 
then they had to, they had to go through self funding and find different ways to they got an early access which was really key for them getting early access getting people on board and that's kind of the main way they funded this game so so yeah so you say that they're working on more uh, more updates more things to add to the game is it just these mm-hmm. two guys working on this game or is there uh, there's, there's the team there, there the main, there's there's a team it's a team of about a dozen people but they're all all over you know all over the United States. I think there might be some couple international. There might be a couple of people. And Andrew himself is from Toronto, so I think there might be a couple of guys in in Canada as well. But it's only a dozen guys. It's only a dozen people working on a on a first person a tactical first person shooter that that people have been saying is better than Call of Duty, which is amazing, amazing to me. So it's you know it's of course it you know Call of Duty. Looks looks way better than the Serpent. I think no one's going to you know no one's going to argue that. But in terms of playing better, you know, people there are a lot of people that are jumping on on Serpent and saying this this is plays so much better than Call of Duty. Um, I've yet to play it myself. I'm looking forward to it. I love games like Counter Strike and uh, yeah, mainly Counter Strike. There hasn't been a game like that around in a while. So. This looks yeah, like it's right up my alley. That game is still selling. Like, I mean, you look on the top sellers on Steam, and it's still selling. Like, number in the top ten, which is this boggles my mind. That game can just has has legs beyond, 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 beyond. Anyways, would they? Yeah. Would they? With this developing development team, uh, what else would they? Do you think they would work on? Do they stick to first person shooters, or you could see them making an RPG or or a story based first person shooter like a Call of Duty or a Bioshock? You know, knowing the background, and knowing that they're there. I mean, I mean, I, I talked to Andrew once in a while, and he was telling me like how he would like, you know, back when Counter Strike was out, and he would like sneak. He would wake up really early before school, like 5 a.m., and sneak downstairs and play Counter Strike for two hours on 56k modems. I think. I remember I think that. That's, yeah. You know, that's where they're kind of for their comfort zone. Um, they might they might very well strike out on different other uh, you know different other genre you know other genres but I think that's what they know and they're comfortable with and I think they just want to kind of they they want to see yeah I, I, it remains to be seen I wouldn't be surprised they're both really bright guys and and mm. they, they, and they know their stuff um, but for now I think they're they're really comfortable and they're really happy with the success of insurgency and they want to foster that success, you know, and foster, you know, and foster a, a good community, which they've been doing a fantastic job of. So, so what's this other game that you have in what's the works? What's this other the game that? I yeah. Have? <laughs> um, sounds the other sounds game different. that I think is kind of right in the wheelhouse of 2DX is um, is Edge of Space. Edge of Space is a is to to it, I think the the PR line. I'm going to give you the PR line, even though I hate it. Is a 2D adventure sandbox survival game, which is a mouthful. But what we like to call it is, if you ever want a Terraria in space, this is, and you want much more a sci a hard sci-fi dark kind of kind of edge to it, this is the game. Um, it's been in development for, well, I mean, I've only been here for like six, six, seven months, but it's been in development for a while, and uh, it's to me, it's, it, as a peer, you know, for me, it's it's. I'm a kind of a as a PR guy. I'm, I'm kind of an anomaly in the sense I love playing like the games that I work on, and I've I don't think I've played not since my early days in, at 2K Sports have I actually played this much of it. I've spent like close to 60 hours on Edge of Space, and why what really appeals to me other than the fact that it is kind of like Terraria, um, you know, you're you know you're it's like very 2D, but it's also there's a lot of Metroid influences in the game, which is to me is really cool. Because being a two D, a fan of two D games, and being a fan of Metroid, that's it's cool. But it's it's all about building up your character, building your 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 command, your 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 commands and your headquarters, and just like hunting down all these and just, just hunting down all these crazy cool. These are some of the the enemies are some of the craziest. Anytime you have a laser shark, space laser shark. Sold. That's you know that's why I usually say space laser sharks sold, right? Tim? Like Austin Powers, like <laughs> yes, very much sharks so. with laser beams Freaking, on their heads. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, it's 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 a really nifty game. Um, it's really um, you can spend hours just like digging and mining. But what's really cool is the work. You know, the dev the dev team is um, Handyman Studios. They're launching, relaunching, I should say, relaunching 
a multiplayer very soon in the next coming weeks, maybe a couple months or so, because uh, um, they did have multiplayer previously, but they took it out because they wanted to streamline. Number one, they wanted to make the single player experience as good as it can be, and they also they also really wanted to work on multiplayer offline, um, you know, away from their fans because they needed to, to really streamline it, make sure that everything's working properly. There's a lot of cool multiplayer aspects uh, that we haven't yet to you know, talk about because we haven't, you know, have had multiplayer in a while. But it's coming soon. It's very, it's coming really soon, and um, it's a game I think that you know people are going to really, really love, um, if they, especially if they love Terraria. Can you talk more about how gameplay-wise, mechanically, how it's like Terraria? Does that mean it's going to be a side-scrolling mm-hmm. 2D, like, Metroid viewpoint? Yeah, so, yes, like, very like much the so. moment-to-moment so moment you, gameplay. You, you, you essentially, the whole idea of the game is you crash land on... You're, you're on this kind of exploration, recolonization kind of a mission, and your, your, your cryopod crashes on, on this planet... And that's and you're pretty much you're left to figure out what to do. You have to figure out what you know what what you know what materials to mine and make you know make your first weapon. Um, how to upgrade your armor? How to how to like what enemies to avoid? Um, you know you, you know it's you know there's you know you know it's off, obviously much more dangerous at night. So there's a lot more dangerous enemies. You have to build your own shelter. Then you upgrade your shelter, and then you explore the planet and you go you know closer you you go you know you start from the very top of the of, of the cr- of the crust of the planet of the very i won't say atmosphere of the planet because there's like these floating kind of worlds flo- floating land masses and you work your way down to the center of the planet and you discover more you know more rare metals more materials more upgrades and uh, it's you know it's it's constantly all about just you know survive you know just exploring and surviving upgrading your weapons Creating bigger batter bases, um, vehicles are in the game, um, and just yeah, it's 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 all about just it's very and you die, you die a lot. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that right now from the from the get go. Enemies are tough. Um, the I mean the most annoying enemy are and these exist in the game. The uh, jetpack space penguins. Um, they fire these annoying. They fly around and they fire these these boomerang rockets, and it's they're they're a pain. They are a pain to deal with, and it's so it's 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 very um yeah it's 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 cool in the sense that it's it is has that Terraria kind of um, feel, but it's it has its own feel too. It's very very sci-fi based. It's you can actually make your own kind of. Down the road, when you start upgrading your bases, you can pro- you can actually make your own in-game computers to, and you can program them to, to do different things on in your base. So it's if you want to get uber geeky, uber nerdy, uber sci-fi, you can with this game, which is is which is really cool. Which is really really cool. I haven't seen any screenshots or footage yet, uh, but you mentioned that it's that has laser sharks, jetpack yes. penguins, and you compare it to Terraria, which has a very Final Fantasy. Five sprite work look to yeah, it. What, what's the art style like? I the art style is like, hmm. I mean, I'll just say this: if you know, in in the world of like, if in in terms of being a sci-fi game, I think they really are. You know, I mean, there's another there's another you know, you know Terrarian space like game called Starbound. But what's different about Starbound and Edge of Space? If Starbound is is kind of in the style of Star Wars. Then Edge of Space is definitely the style of Star Trek. Like it's much more technical. It's much more. It's I would say it's much more. Un, you know, it's less forgiving. It's you get really techy. The weapons you you know you get are are you know are very like te- you know very techy. Um, I mean, there's there's prototype weapons. There's you know you know it's there's v, there's there's gas. There's a very complex like. Uh, kind of gas system that you know that you that you that you use if you upgrade far enough into the game, um, it's it's not as cute as Terraria. Um, mm-hmm. I, that's why, but I think I think the developers didn't want it to be necessarily cute because it's you're surviving in space. It's you're on the edge of space. It's kind of gritty. It's kind of dark. It's kind of very dangerous. So it's yeah, it's a it's I think it has an edgier style to it. Um, and if I were to, yeah, it's 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 definitely not as you know cute. I I think is the best way to, to say it. So but it's close closer to the Super Metroid like Zebus Brinstar, that that dark 
2D graphic kind of if quality. You, I, I would say Metroid's a definite, definite influence. Are you familiar with Turricane? Yeah, yeah, yes. I would say there's yeah. a definite influence of Turricane in there as well. So it's um, so yeah, it's it. That's that. I mean, that's you know, you know, people watching this probably have no idea what's Turricane. Well, look it up on Wikipedia, kiddies. Um, <laughs> It's a, uh, it's, it has a, it's, it's a cool art style. It's, it's cool. It's, it's, I, I like it. I like because it's kind of very, it's very sci-fi, very edgy. Has almost a, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to say anime influence because that would be very unfair. But it definitely has a kind of, I would say, sleeker, edgier sci-fi style to it. Who is, who is the team behind Edge of Space? Okay, Edge of Space is, is developed by Handman Studios, and it's predominantly, and I really mean this, a two-man team. <laughs> so, it's a uh, the main uh, uh, Jacob Crane is the main, is the head is head it's kind of head honcho, and you know he has a developer Paul, and unfortunately I don't even, his main developer is Paul, and I don't even know Paul's last name, which is really sad. I should really get his last name. And then they 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 kind of work with other like. They kind of freelance out like you know duties of art and and sound and other stuff to other people, um, and they're considered part of the team. But the the main it's really just a two man team just crunching away at this game, and it's 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 cool. It's it's really one of the you know I've you know I've worked I've done PR for big companies, Sega, 2K Sports, and I've worked with big development teams, and it's really cool to work with, the, with these indie guys because. This is their livelihood. I mean, this, and I'm not, say, I'm not saying that you know other dev teams. This is not their livelihood. But when you sometimes these guys like you know to support you know to really support their families and to make rent, they need to. They're they're putting all their kind of chips in this game. You know, it's it's really and when and when you know they're making a game a really when you see the potential of the game. You know, you you it's it's really it's really cool it's th- that you know, and especially when the potential starts coming out, and you can see that this game is going to you know has a lot of legs, and you say, yeah, wait till the world sees this. It's very exciting. It's very exciting to be part of this indie process. So it's uh, it's different. It's cool. So is this game going to be on Steam as well? Yes. It well it, it is. It's on early access on Steam right now. It's it, it's it was green light is green lit green lighted green lit on Steam. Um, it's currently available early access. You can get early you know get you get into it on early access. And I suggest you do it now, considering that you know we're going to be launching multiplayer very soon. And it's when multiplayer launches, that's going to be uh, we expect a lot of people to be like, wow, what is this edge of space game? This it's it's come along a long way. It's it's God, I hate. Hey, when I my phrasing is terrible, it can come a long, a long way. It's it's come a long way um, from from even from the early screenshots I saw like six months ago, and I've been playing the game quite a bit myself, and it's it's cool. It's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's, I mean, for me, um, I was never a huge Terraria player, but I was I was and still kind of am a, a huge Diablo two player, huge, and I can see a lot of um, the kind of the not not necessarily there's no direct correlation of mechanics or art style, but um, the, there, there's definitely a feeling of you know collecting stuff and building up your character and upgrading your armor and weapons and going out there and death is you know you better be careful when you go out there because the mo- those monsters and enemies they swarm and they're gonna just they're just gonna mess you up. So it's it's pretty hardcore. It's 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 cool. It's yeah. So it. Um. In any case, yeah. It's gonna multiplayer launch is gonna be coming very soon. Plus, we have all the um, Terraria content that you know we're gonna reveal very soon. Uh, we did a quick. We kind of did a quick reveal announcement about it. I think PAX last year, but the content should be coming. The actual Terraria content should be coming very soon, with a couple surprises as well. That I think. Um. That um. I think hardcore. You know, fans of of Edge of Space and fans of Terraria are really gonna get a kick out of. So. So yeah. Are you guys going to be at PAX this year? Yes. With uh, Age of Space and Insurgency? Uh, We're still making out the plans. I'm fairly certain both games will be. It's still in the planning phase at this time. I know, of course, Reverb will be there with other indie titles. Um, But um, I'm fairly... I I have a good feeling that both... I know Edge of Space will definitely be there, and I think Insurgency will be there as well. Okay, we we will be too. We're going to go to PAX and... Oh, dear. ...raid the indie scene. You indie guys are just so welcoming and warm. It's it's great. What is it about yeah. you that's just that's just so? 
like womb like I guess that <laughs> you know more compared to uh, EA or Ubisoft or whoever else you, you you're just you welcome us and we appreciate that because we're all about the people we're all about the kids we're doing it for the kids it's not the money it's for the kids oh, thank you someone is thinking, <laughs> thinking of the children mm. womb like what the what, do you think it's time to move on to game fan it's a, it's entirely up to you, Tim. It's <laughs> entirely up to you. What would you what would you like to know about Game Fan? Well, for those who don't know, because there are probably a whole bunch of kiddies out there who don't know what Game Fan is. I find you... that really hard to believe, but go ahead. <laughs> Could you describe what it is? Game Fan was anyway, Game Fan still exists to a certain extent today, but Game Fan was a print publication back. Whew, before the year 2000. Oh, man, now I'm <laughs> dating myself. Um, it, and at the time, it was... And I saw some of your questions, your prep questions. And, and when you, one of the quite prep questions you asked was, do you, I think was something to the effect of, do you find GameFan was a, was, a pi- was a pioneer in the industry? Mm-hmm. And my initial, my initial thought was, ha, <laughs> pioneer, no. But then I started thinking about it, and I think, GameFan was one of the first video game magazines to actually start using a lot of screenshots, massive screenshots, really yeah. cool screenshots, and that was one of the big draws of GameFan. And I think a lot of magazines after GameFan started started using that same tactic because, as much as we want to say we're all editors and people want to read our writing, you know, kitties they want to see bright, cool pictures. They want to see explosions. They want to see they just want to see cool stuff back in the day, like seeing really cool screenshots of games. Mm. Especially of the games that were covered in Game Fan, and Game Fan was also, I think, one of the first magazines to really put an emphasis on imports, Japanese import games, um, and that was that that was a kind of a thing as well that they started, and you started seeing other magazines going, oh yeah, maybe we should cover this game because, you know, this game uh, natu- most imports would naturally come to the U.S. So it was almost like an advanced preview of what was coming. So, um, so in a sense, yeah, actually, Game Fan pioneered a lot of stuff. Um, Game fans started as a kind of a brochure almost for um, it was for a diehard game club, um, these bunch of video game stores in Southern California, and then it started. People started reading more about these brochures and started getting into it. And then the, I think the original founder, um, Dave Halverson, started. Well, why don't we just make a magazine? And that's kind of how the genesis started. So oh, I it was like was the not, game informer of its time. It very much so. Very yeah. much so. Oh, yeah, very much so. And. I joined on in '97, so I was I was actually I came on like kind of late in the game fan cycle, um, way before a lot of pe- other people, and you know way before a lot of the hmm, more interesting tales of game fan. Um, you know whether it's the uh, um, well I'll just say it Jat bastard issue or the um, or the um, Cybermorph cover story. Yes, I was be- I, it, those those events happened. Way before I joined on, but but I've heard and know the stories, and I can I, I know actually a lot of the facts too, and a lot of the facts that you've read are very true. So oh oh, could you re- reiterate those facts? And I'm not what what was the Cybermorph story? That's new to me. I knew about the uh, okay. The... So Cybermorph, which was a Atari, was one of the Atari Jaguar uh, launch games. Um, oh, the Jaguar! Oh man. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it was. Cybermorph was basically a tech demo for Atari Jaguar. The gameplay was just, um, <laughs> but it, I mean, it showed some cool tech. And the story goes that uh, the reason why Cybermorph was became was became a game fan, game fan like cover story of all games, um, was and the rumor was that um, that uh, Dave Halverson had been drinking coffee laced with LSD. And when he played Cybermorph, it was an out-of-world experience. And that rumor is not a rumor. That is true. <laughs> that someone oh slipped. Goodness. And it wasn't just David Halverson. Someone thought it would be a cool prank to slip LSD in the office coffee. And so it was. from what I understand, it wasn't just Dave Halverson tripping on LSD. It was a number of people <laughs> that were Could, could Martin tripping. Scorsese make like a Wolf of Wall Street version of the game fan <laughs> days? <laughs> This sounds unbelievable. <laughs> there, there, the things that went on 
at Game Fan before my time and during my time. And I, I mean, I, there are some things I can't even reveal, and I don't want to reveal that happened at my time during Game, game Fan. But I mean, sure. I mean, yeah, whether it was like full nudity or, or oh god, it's, it's so much shit happened <laughs> in those days. But it was it was fun stuff. Um, so, anyways, so that's how the Cybermorph story and that 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 is actually very true. Um, the Jap Bastard story, which is one of the more kind of um, what happened was I I don't rec- I don't it was a sports review of a game in one of the issues I forget what sport what what game, but in the text there was it it was just a rant about how you Jap Bastards and this and this and that and and it I mean it went out and it got published. I mean, it went out to like I don't know, seventy-five thousand subscribers to people, and then one newsstands. And um, the the reasoning behind that was not the reason. There's no reasoning behind that, but um, it was just filler text, and it was filler text from one of the editors to one of the design, one to one of the um, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, what you call it, graphic artists, graphic designers. Um, the graphic designer was named was Waka Mike Wakamatsu. He was Japanese. So in, in in it was in all in good jest, but the because because deadlines, especially printing back then, like you would just everything gets slapped together at the last minute. Something someone forgot to uh, forget someone someone forgot version two to ship out version two instead of version one of that page, and then it went out, and then Jap bastard, Jap bastard, Jap bastard. It was it was infamous. You can still actually if you actually. I'm sure if you Google Jap Bastard in Game Band, you can still probably find the original article somewhere. So oh my it's... gosh. Could you imagine if something like that happened today in, in the era of Gawker oh my and God. Polygon? <laughs> oh my god. I mean, it, with social media, I mean, it would have gone to some... It would. I mean, it would have gone to some... Like, it would have gone to some group, and they would have had a hailstorm, and someone would have gotten fired, and, you know, and... Yeah, god, it would have been awful. <laughs> it would have been, yeah. been awful, but you know, thank God for those on the, thank God for those print days, for those glory days of print. You know, it's yeah. So I'm not sure but if yeah. jest and satire can even be tolerated <laughs> in the days of Twitter and Facebook. You, I mean, everything gets in. It's hard to read. It's hard to read sar- sarcasm. We we re- definitely need someone needs to figure out a sar a, sar- a sarcasm font sometime soon because it's. <laughs> It's um, it's yeah. Things get misconstrued all the time. You read, you know, read different Twitters. You know, grammar, grammar is definitely missing from like from Twitter posts and whatnot. And, and oh my things gosh. get misconstrued even, all the time. Even um, headlines on um, websites. I saw one today, like on ET online or something about a uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I was reading the headline. And I was like, that is the wrong word for for your headline. Like <laughs> affect effect. You know, it was like. <laughs> It was anyway. Not to throw ET online under the bus, but can you talk about your your role with the magazine? Yes, and actually, if you heard, if you just heard, my email went off, and my meeting at six o'clock is canceled, so I actually have more time now. So, oh um, great, <laughs> good. You're all mine. Oh hey now. Um, so, I mean, just to talk about the glory days of. Oh, of video I got gotcha, you, got gotcha, you, got gotcha, you. Gotcha, video game gotcha, print. You know, um, I was. Um, so I had just got out of college at USC and you know looking for employment obviously and I was a economics major of all things and um, but I was a big I was a vi- big 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 time video game you know big game, a fan of video games and actually the summer before before summer before of uh, summer '96 I actually was t- during the summer I was testing games at Sega I was testing Sega Saturn games and I freaking loved it it was a I mean. Of course, it was Sega Saturn games. I mean, but I mean, it was still, oh I was God. doing what I love for a living, and I was like, I have to figure out a way to do this. So I was, I forget where I was. I was either, I think I was searching Game Fan, just just looking at the website, and there was an ad for Mega Fan, and Mega Fan at the time was the strategy, the the strategy subset of Game Fan. So I said, why not? So I put my application in there and. Um, flo and behold, they called me, and so from LA, I went, I'm not sure how familiar with LA, but I had to drive to Agora Hills, which is like in the valley, um, which is about an hour and a half away from LA, and I went in there for an interview, and they, if I recall correctly, they hired me on the spot, and I interviewed with uh, David Hodgson, so shout out to Dave Hodgson, if, I'm not sure if you're watching this, Dave, but 
you know, guy who gave me my first break in the in the game. So uh, he, I owe him a lot of, I owe him a lot because he got me uh, my first job um, doing strategy guides for GameFan. My first strategy section in MegaFan was uh, Star Fox, Star Fox 64. Yeah, yeah. So that was oh, wow. that was my, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, it was. So I was doing, I was actually doing strategy guides for GameFan, uh, for MegaFan, and for GameFan actually, for that matter. And then um, eventually, I got my, I got my cho- I got my chance to do my first review. I can't remember my first review. That's pretty sad. Ugh. But yeah, that's. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that's any how, other that's, how I got, that's how I got started. Um, and we all, another thing that GameFan did a lot of was, the, they would do these super in-depth like strategy guides. Um, fight, especially for fighting games, and I had worked on the official Marvel versus Marvel superheroes um, uh, for uh, a strategy guide, and I worked with you know the aforementioned uh, James Chen, Jen, Chenzer, and we spent hours upon hours taking screenshots of of, of a sequence of a combos. And if you, I'm not sure if you played Marvel superheroes, but I mean, I have. There were, that if, game there still at least has a ever, following. Yeah, that and well, what I was gonna bring up was at least I think there's at least six or seven characters with infinite combos, and there was at least a lot of those characters had like 20 hit strings. So imagine taking screenshots of each string and trying to write a little like caption for each one, for and you did it. And I and the sad thing is it never got published. It never got published because oh, no. um, when we sent it to Marvel, they turned it down because. Um, Hulk's green was not green enough, or something like that, and we were just like, "Screw it, we're not going to do it." And so I spent like a good month and a half, a month and a half on a strategy guide that never got published. So, yeah. So th- those are good days. Those are good times. Good times. Good times <laughs> of just spending hours and hours just pl- doing a combo over and over and over again, and just trying to capture the perfect screenshot. So, um, so yeah, that that's so that's how I got started at Game Fan, and then. From then, I moved my. I, I did some stuff for the magazine, Game Fan Magazine, but my primary role was actually doing a lot of stuff on Game Fan Online, the website. So um, that was like that was kind of you know where I'll, where that was majority of my time spent was doing stuff for Game Fan Online, writing different columns. Um, I'm not sure if people do remember, but my moniker was Dongo Head. So um, you know, because back then everyone had a had a different kind of like. Alias, different characters, different superhero. So yeah, so. why why was that? I remember GamePro did that kind of thing too back in the and day. What, what was the reason? That, that 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 standard. But so I think uh, when Halverson started doing it, he wanted to like kind of that. that I guess that was kind of popular thing. He also gave you an alias. Yeah, you know, it's, it was it was kind of cool. So um, so yeah, that was. Um, I can't see. I don't know why we it, it got started that way, but it's I I think it was just a copycat type, type of thing. So, so yeah. I guess it was like the the AOL, the movie hackers, those kind of days. Like that was just a cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it was, and I think and people got and people and people got a kick out of it. People were like, who the hell is this? Who is a superhero with a big donut on his head? I mean, it was you know, it's, it's, it's people get a kick out of it, and it was it was cool. It you know, and you play, and what was cool is it, it was a different persona from each of the editors. So you saw kind of a different side. People were like. Get into their characters, and I don't know. It was, it was cool. It was fun. Those were fun days. Those were fun days for sure. What were some of the most um, uh, any other memorable stories or, or pieces of game coverage uh, you had wow. that you had to do? Let's see here. Well, uh, there is okay. So there is one story where um, the office uh, was shut down by the uh, marshal service. And for like a couple of days, like the whole office, like we couldn't work. And what we found out was um, Capcom, who, uh, who at the time I put out Resident Evil 2, which I uh, – another strategy guide I worked on. Um, uh, they had tracked pirates. The original so – pirate, Resident Evil 2 was being like – the, like the preview versions were being pirated. And they were able to track it to the GameFan office. And – that's why it got shut down because someone from GameFan had let out um, a copy of Resident Evil uh, pre-version and copied it like to every like pirated it, and so for about uh, for I want to say two days the office was shut down, <laughs> and we and we were really worried. We were like, 
crap, are we out of a job? What's going on here? So, and eventually they found the culprit. It was a former former game fan um, editor who had uh, who had stupidly. <laughs> pirated a, uh, a version of the game, not and I guess they didn't realize that they could get tracked back, um, and so um, and, and uh, yeah, it was that was interesting. That was an interesting day. Um, huh. In terms of what were some of the things that we there, there were so many pranks. There were so many pranks, and there was so much. Oh man, um, one thing that we loved doing, and personally I loved doing. Uh, was arcade coverage like covering back then? The arcades were still alive. Street Fighter was still was full was full in full effect. So we we would actually do a lot of road trips to like I mean we're in Southern California, but we would do a lot of road trips to you know like you know Sunnyvale Golfland and like because a lot of the Capcom games were testing there and we would cover tournaments and this and, and all this stuff and that was those were those were really. I mean, you were talking about like spending your own money just to go there and just capture some footage, or, or just get some handicam footage and some video, or and talk to these guys and like and get some getting really getting working your ass off to get some exclusives. Like when, especially when you're going when IGN was starting to get big and you're going against like EGM, the Game Pro guys, and you really wanted to get a good scoop. And, and and to do that, you had to actually sometimes go to the arcades <laughs> to get some of these get first looks of these games, like. I remember, I remember going there and uh, seeing a uh, a pre uh, an early version of jo- uh, of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I was looking at the game. I'm like, what is this game that we're covering? This is so weird. And um, little and little did we know there was a cult following for this game, and it was a big scoop for us. So it was those were the days when you actually had to work really hard and. And exclusives, I guess exclusives or or scoops actually meant something. And now they, it's kind of sad. You don't see that much anymore, you know, any of that more of that anymore because you know social media. People are posting stuff all the time, and it's not that big of a deal, of a deal when a, a big outlet like an IGN or a Polygon or, oh, well, you still get see you still see scoops, but like it's really sad, especially at the print pubs. So you, know, you don't see like Game Informers like the last kind of man standing really. Um, I guess you have like you know you have PC gamer, but even the print it's kind of sad to see the print pub you know you know, print pubs go away that they are and then the the slow but eventual death of them. But um, what else at Game Fan? God, there's so many so many memories. I still keep in touch with those guys too. Like um, sh- I'm not sure if people those who remember Game Fan Shidoshi, he actually works at EGM now. Um, and you know it's we've all it's I would say but I would say like. Not that many of us from the game fan days are still in the game industry. I would say, I would say less than thirty percent of us are still in the game. Um, the rest have gone on there to do their own thing. So it's, it's, it, it was a, it was a fun time. It was definitely a fun time. Definitely a different time. Very, a very uh, politi- politically incorrect time. Uh, the the amount of man, they're just <laughs> it is just a bad scene. Every day was an adventure. Every day was a you had to have thick skin. Working at Game Fan, you had to. So, so yeah. oh wow, uh, very very different today. Can we talk oh, about yes. games journalism oh, yes. today? I, f- first, I want to ask how do you, how do you feel about um uh, the ties that may or may not exist between games publishers and games magazines and publications? Can you talk about that? What do you mean exactly? Well, I mean the the idea is that um. I mean the the Jeff Gerstmann controversy, the uh, Polygon changing their their review scores because of uh, EA and some cities uh, troubles. I mean, can you talk about um, the relationship between games publishers and uh, game magazines and and what websites? Do you think there is some kind of uh, you know pay for play kind of thing going on? I mean, this is you know okay. Uh, so let me put it this way. Mm-hmm. It always comes down to that adage of money talks, bullshit walks. I mean, let's be real, kiddies. This has been going on ages before ages. I mean, any way a publisher can try to influence a good score, a good review, better coverage, I mean, they're going to do it. I mean, they're going to try to do it, and that's just the game. And I don't know if you can really blame the game publisher because all they're trying to do is put their their game in the best light. And... Sure, it might be deceptive, especially if the game is crappy and you're trying to influence them. But you know, even the good, even the 
even the guys who make great games, you know, they're going to try to do the same thing. They don't have to try as hard, obviously, because their game is great. I mean, i.e. Grand Theft Auto 5, you know, the GTA. I mean, they're going to... Everyone's going to cover that game, so they don't really have to work the ad as hard as, say, like, oh, I don't know, like, you know, like, for example, uh, when, when, you know, when Fez first, you know, indie game Fez, who knew about it? Who really had to push, you know, push that game? Um, which is kind of, which is what's cool about indie developers is because even though they're trying to, you know, they're trying to make a buck and they're trying to do their best to make money, it's also about their, this, it's their baby, that's their product, that's what they represent, you know, I mean, but, and back to the original question, which is, you know, game publishers, yeah, they're going to, they're going to try to influence as much as they can to make, the, to have their game perceived in the best light, in the best way. Is it the fault of editors and the game, and the game magazines that they're allowing this? To a certain degree, yes, but you also have to balance it out by saying, hey, we've got to get paid. We want to make it, we've got to put a magazine out there. People want to read this stuff, so I mean, it's. It, I guess it's it's a it's a it's a editorial moral balance, I suppose. But um, to think that this is only happening now, oh my God, give me a break. Seriously, this has been happening even in Game Man days. I mean, I mean, there. A, a good example is you know, for example, at Game Fan, we wanted to do a we knowing that Resident Evil was going to be a big game, one of the big things, we couldn't promise them the best coverage because GameFan wasn't, you know, wasn't as big, widely circulated as like an EGM or a Game Pro or whatever at that time. But we, well, if we said, hey, we'll throw on, we'll also do a strategy guide for you, you know, at half cost or whatever, you know, that's good for us because, you're, you know, we're getting this, and if you throw us the exclusive to Resident Evil, that's good for us because we got the exclusive to Resident Evil, it's good for them because they get more eyes on the Resident Evil play. So, I mean, this has been happening f forever. I mean, people getting upset about editorial integrity, sure, be upset about it. You know, hold up, hold your editors to a you know that standard if you want them to. But let's also live in reality that, you know, game publishers are going to try their best, and editorial teams are they're going to they want to cover what they what what they think is what people want to read. What their and what their audience wants to read. So, and it's I, the main thing is to me is that you know I hear read about these things and I'm like, eh, it's been going on for a while. So what? Mm. What what issues, if any, do you think face games journalism today besides uh, the influence of game publishers? If any, do you have any advice for games journalists out there, or what? Do, what do you think of uh, sites like Polygon and Kotaku? When, when I, you, love, I really that. like Polygon. Well, Polygon and Kotaku, they do different. To, to me, they do two different things. And I and I know Kotaku. They they also do they also do some serious you know like journalism if you want to call it editorials. But I go to Kotaku because they're you know they're they're snarky. There's there's these weird offbeat articles, and that's why I go to Kotaku for. I think that's what most people go there for. They do have good editorial you know um, you know um, editorial sections set you know, sections, and it's it's cool. Polygon, I, I really enjoy a lot because they actually go into you know, not just the game development and the mechanics and all the other stuff, but they also go into the kind of the human nature story of game development, game design, why this, the philo the you know philosoph the phil philosophy of designing a game this way than that way, and I think you know, I think that's really cool. Um, as far as I mean, the future of game journalism or editorial, I mean, we can all agree that. Print print pubs are pretty much dead, at least in the U.S. They're still surviving in Europe for some reason. I mean, there's if you go to Europe, there's like there's there's a there's a ton of game magazines still out there. It's it's amazing to me. Um, I think another thing is, I, I think that what one thing that I I think we all saw coming with the advent of the internet was now anyone can be considered a game editor. You jump on there, you know, you read. You read like on different forums these all these long reviews and these and there there are there are really good writers out there that are, you know that you know they might might not be doing this full time but they know how to write but it's it seems like there's just a, a influx of people that 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 believe they my opinion counts more than your opinion and this and this and that and you know, you get into a, a into dangerous ground when you start you know really trusting user reviews and I guess 
and I guess that's a good and bad thing when you start developing. If, if you if you're a user out there and you start writing your own reviews, it's it's cool that you're doing it, but it's also you know what? Don't get too high and mighty about it because let's keep it in perspective. Now you're writing a review about a video game, so <laughs> I mean let's and. It, 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 uh, what I do miss is what the press box with the print pubs is. You know, you had guys there in the print pubs that. What's working? I I, work, I used to work at IGN, and one of the things that was really cool, and also I thought was also a big problem, was you didn't have a word count. You could write long, and for a time that was the thing. You had to write the longest review possible of a game because people thought, oh, it's not a long review, then it's. Why should I read it? He doesn't know his stuff, and like you had to actually kind of longer review somehow equaled more experienced writer. But it's actually a lot harder to condense your words and get it to the essence in writing in print rather so than you know writing you know online. You know now now I think they figured it out. You see reviews now, and people don't want to really. Re I mean, people that go online, most people don't even want to read reviews. They want to either, especially with let's plays and whatnot. Of the YouTubes and live streams, people just want to see the game and they want to hear funny commentary. They don't necessarily want to be informed. Um, at least I, I, at least that's that seems to be the going the, the going trend right now. Um, I think that I think it's it's cool. This it's really cool to see the live streams and let's plays and these these different personalities reviewing games for different reasons and for some off. But I mean, let's I mean you know let's you know what's his name. Uh, from the escapist. Uh, Yahtzee. Yahtzee. That guy has got it down. I I love watching his video. I love watching. I mean, he he critic he's over critical games, but you know that going in, and he he's, you develop a personal style. I you know there's I wish there were more guys like him and you know that Total Biscuit is another one. Guys like that that know their stuff, that have a style, and they and they have and they're doing it at a, at at the for the audience that they want to. We what be watching them is great. Th those are those are great, um, and I you know maybe hopefully we'll have more personalities like that. I mean, heck, everyone's jumping on Twitch right now, so I mean, I mean everyone's kind of going that route, and and it's cool. You see different personalities do that. I've gone off tangent because your original question was, what do I think about game journalism in general? And I think it's in flux. It's it's. It's you know it's and it goes in cycles too. I and mean, this this is the new cycle. The, these video reviews, these live streamers, the YouTubers, and people are trying to figure out exactly what's the best. You know how how who's their audience? Who are they speaking to? And just because you have the, the you know obviously people are more attracted to people you know that with you know guys personalities that have a huge following, have a huge subscription base. But I think what's hopefully may be in the cards is you know in the future is there will be a different, a bunch of different personalities, and that's and and each one will offer something different to each person, and they give their own unique view. They give their they're more informative than the others. Maybe they have more style. Maybe they're good, better looking. I don't know, but um, that, I think that's it's 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 a different, it's this this is a new cycle of uh, kind of video game editorial, if you call it that. So yeah, it's 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 in flux. I guess is the best answer. How do you feel about um? Triple A games today. All the games that get ten tens and get compared to Citizen Kane and whatnot. Oh, and what was their equivalent back in in the nineties and in, in the game fan days? Do you, do you think there was a, an equivalent back then? If you were to ask me, gun to my head, best game ever made, I would instantly say Gunstar Heroes. Um, Gunstar Heroes and. No one remembers Gunstar Heroes, but you know what? If you, oh no, we do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In terms of what a video game should be to me, Gunstar Heroes is it. I mean, nonstop, crazy, Twitch action, cool upgrades, cool, very stylized visuals. Uh, just shoot 'em up, crazy ass bosses. Gunstar Heroes was just like. It was it to me? I mean, I was just like, oh my god, this is the greatest game ever designed. Um, and I that game and and the pacing of that game was great too. I mean, it was hard, but it was hard, but not like throw your controller and smash it into like a billion pieces hard. It was more like challenging. Okay, I learned my mistake. I got to remember this kind of hard. Um, I 
I, people, I don't want to say people. Now I'm now I'm general generalizing. Um, when you see games like you know GTA Five, I mean, there's no doubt that game for what it is is really is great. I mean, the scope and size and everything. But I don't think necessarily GTA Five is for everyone. Um, it's it, you know you have to, it, and in some ways it's it's limited in terms of its story progression. It's very limited in a sense because. One thing, telling to me, and I've always thought about this, video games is the next storytelling mechanic. People, you can tell brilliant stories through video games, and I don't think people have really taken advantage of, or I mean, I don't say people, but like developers have been set in their ways that this is how you, this is how you tell a story, and you don't, and there's not many, you know, and there's not, and there's, there hasn't been a, many ways of, t- of innovating the storytelling element. There are some guys have tried. Um, I don't know if there's been a great story. I don't remember the last great story. Well, no, I you know what? When Ico came out, Ico on yes. PlayStation 2, that was, that was, that was really cool. <laughs> that was really yeah. the way they presented the story the, and everything. And I don't remember. Yeah, that was, that was, that was great. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think what's missing is you know you see GTA Five and the scope, the multiplayer, the the char- the characters are actually kind of cool, but the, the, the actual storytelling mechanic itself hasn't changed since GTA Three. Yeah, for all I for all I can remember. Mm, so neither it's... neither has the the controversy. People are still still get up in arms in the fact that oh you're playing as um less than you know, less than nice people. You're playing as villains. Yeah, nah. but I mean, that's the fascination of you know gangster life, and it, it you know whether you're like into like into you know whether it's like you know actual like Compton like Compton gang gangsters or you know or the actual Italian mob mafioso. I mean, crime has always been something that people are fascinated with, and you know you can't blame GTA you know and you know you know and which call it Take Two and. Uh, a rock, you know, rock star for going to that because that's what people want, and if people, you know, that's what people want, that's fine. And as long as you make a solid game, and they did, they make a more than solid game. The game itself is, is, is in terms of the design and scope, is is crazy. But to me, for me as a gamer, storytelling is is, and I go back to Final Fantasy three and or slash six. Um, was yeah, the one with uh, Terra and Celis and Edgar and Locke and Mog. What was so cool about that game, besides the music and everything, the characters, is the side stories that you when you when you first play the game, you would miss like a bunch of side stories, like the dream sequences and whatnot. I mean, and that stuff is just random. Oh, not necessarily random, but like you have to watch a dream sequence like at a, you know like three or four times, and somehow it affects the gameplay. I thought that was brilliant. I thought it was so cool to have in a game. I thought it was that was really, I mean, and then you know you have Shenmue, which is probably one of the <laughs> most underappreciated games of all time. Um, yeah, it is, and it's sad that the series never continued. And the reason why it didn't succeed because the the the, the main you know the main hero was a goody two shoe. If he was darker, I mean, Sh- Yakuza has sold more overall than Shenmue, and that blows my mind because Shenmue. Any game with a with with quick time you know events owes owes something to Shenmue and Yu Suzuki because that was that's what Shenmue started that whole that whole that, that the whole mechanic the whole sure, sure. And it gave it it gave it its name quick time yeah. events that's that's all exactly. Yu Suzuki so yeah. it's so, so yeah it's um how do I get off tangent here what do I, what do we, <laughs> what do we start? oh storytelling um, yes. yeah so um, and I think one of the okay one of the uh, I'm, I'm now I'm really dating myself. So, do you, are, were you? Uh, do you know about the Choose Your Own Adventure books? Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, I think okay. uh, Goosebumps now, had a series, know, and even Nintendo, I think, made a book a book series like like, like that with Mega Man Two. Remember, and... Now, during the when Choose Your Own Adventure books were around, now this is starting to become the most uninteresting podcast ever. Um, <laughs> uh, there was a series of of Choose Your Own Adventure books, but it was called the Lone Wolf series by Joe Deaver. No, yes, I'm, no. I'm, I'm unfamiliar. It is, does it have anything to do with Lone Wolf and Cub, the manga? Yes. No, 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 no. It have, no, it has nothing to do with Lone Wolf and Cub. That'd be cooler. But 
No, it's a. <laughs> it was basically a RPG in a book, and it was and it was based kind of like on choose your own adventure, and I was a fan of it back in the day. Just last year, they came out with a mobile game version of that game, and let me tell you, this you know I'm I'm pipping a game that's not even mine, but um, that the Lone Wolf mobile game for both iOS and iPad. The way they tell the story and the art and the music and the voiceovers ties together so fantastically. And I I cannot... If you really want to see some really cool storytelling done in a video game, really give... Look for that mobile app, Joe, Joe Dever's Lone Wolf, uh, D-E-V-E-R. Um, and it's, it's a little slow loading, it's a little buggy, but the way they present... Because you're actually reading a book and you're doing... It's almost like choose your own adventure, but then there's when you go into a battle sequence... It's like full unreal 3D to kind of like touch, you know, touch touch combat. It's it's brilliant to me. It's I, I cannot rave more about that game. It's it's so cool the way they did the storytelling, and I think that's what's missing. It's really to me from what's missing for me in, in the gaming industry is different ways of how to tell stories, and you know, and that's and you know, you give me that, and I'll be really happy. You give Titanfall is going to be awesome. And you know, all these other next gen games that are coming out should be really cool. But I give me something that has some meat to the storytelling and tell it in a very unique and different way. You'll have me sold. What was the name of this game again? The Choose Your Own Adventure. Uh, Joe, it's so uh, Joe Dever's Lone Wolf. Uh, it's it's Joe D Joe Dever Dever spelled D E V R. It's on. You can get it in your iPhone. You get it in your iPad. Uh, it's not my game, so I'm not pimping it for like any <laughs> any other reason other than to me. You want to see something, some really cool storytelling. You want to see how, how you just want to see see something very unique, uniquely done. Go check it out. Okay, not free to play. By the way, it's not free to play. All right, I want to, I want to, I'm going to wrap up by going back okay. to uh, to Game Fan a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Would you consider Game Fan to be integral in, in the anime push in the anime boom back in the? In the mid to late '90s, I mean, I, I, I think that's another aspect that you know I didn't when you said Python was game fan a pioneering magazine presence. Um, the I mean, the fact that it was a magazine that focused on imports on Japanese imports, you know, that easily allowed itself to be also in the conversation of anime, and it allowed you know a lot of of course a lot of these import games are based off anime, so I mean it. It was it, 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 Game Fan did was one of the first magazines to really introduce that element. Um, whether or not you know it was like um, you know opened the floodgates to anime, I don't. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't go beyond that. But I will say that you know it was one of the first, and I think it was because they covered imports. We covered imports you know, back in the day that you know that anime became you know you know I want. I don't want to start say you know it it. Gave anime a, a bigger presence uh, in the video game industry, but I certainly think that, you know, that's something that fans, you know, fans who played import games, say, oh, let me check that anime out. I mean, it certainly didn't hurt at all, and and I think it was it was a, it was just another kind of aspect that made Game Fan unique in that sense. So sure. I mean, I, I would credit it as such because I I think it got it definitely got me interested in it because it had it reviewed uh, VHS tapes. At the time, I think every month <laughs> oh, there were new reviews. So um, I was like, "Oh, this looks this looks great!" And it looks like all the video games I love, like um, Lunar and Snatcher, or oh, yes. all 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 games I couldn't play at the time because they were on Sega CD then. But I was always oh, and Ease too. The Ease series, I credit Game Fan for getting me interested in because oh, of the reviews. Geez. And you're, the... you're dating yourself, Tim. I didn't. You don't even look that old. <laughs> well, thank you. Neither do you, man. We look great. Well, I have the Asian blood, you know, so that's of course. <laughs> um, I just drink a lot of green tea. Oh, I gotcha. No, uh, I, I do. I credit. I'm not sure if I credit game. I mean, for me, I was, you know, I was also a fan of the magazine Game Fan, but I don't. For me, I didn't. It, game Fan wasn't a conduit for anime for me. I mean, I liked anime from. I mean, growing up watching like Channel 26 and seeing like you know. You know, Gotcha Man, and like you know, and uh, what you call it? Um, what was the other one? Voltron, of course, and Robotech. You know, I was. I mean, that was just cool. Robots, you know, planes that transform into robots. Holy cow! I mean, that was. I mean, I mean, that was that was cool to me. I, 
didn't really need that, you know, that con that um, Game Fan wasn't a big wasn't a big influence for my anime taste. But I know, you know, certainly that it, certainly people who read Game Fan knew about anime and then got therefore got interested in anime for sure for certain. So sure. Because there wasn't a whole lot of um, there wasn't any literature or any way no, to there was nothing there to was read about it then. No, I mean, let me think. Was there even like a? I mean, I think you know, um, what's that comic book magazine? Wizard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think they did some stuff just because Maybe of the Star article. Log. Do you remember? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and but no one really did any major anime coverage. Well, you know, you know, purely anime coverage until, oh, I don't even know what was the first anime magazine. What was that? Jeez, I don't recall. I mean, but certainly, I mean, Game Fan introduced you know anime and had to you know the import gaming stuff certainly helped get people more into anime and know more about the characters and the art style was very cool too. I mean, I mean, people were kind of got tired of like you know. Hanna Barbera type cartoons, and they saw this new style, and I'm like, "Whoa, this is crazy cool!" So, so yeah. Now I'm really dating myself. Hanna Barbera. Does anyone know that reference? No. Anyone? Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, maybe. Scooby Doo <laughs> is still popular. So. Okay, Anything Anthony. Um, are there any other words you'd like to say about insurgency or edge of space? Get insurgency now. Do it. Do it for the kids. Um, no, if I, I think, if you're looking for, if you don't mind dying. And dying a lot, um, and you're looking for a, a, a real refreshing first-person shooter experience, check out Insurgency. It's on Steam right now. It's like top 10 right now. I think it's $14.99. Um, it's worth it. It's, it's, worth, it's worth checking it out, especially if you're into the tactical... If you're into tactical shooters and you, you, know, and you don't mind the visuals being slightly dated, because they are slightly dated... There's no doubt about that, but they look. I mean, the effects are work, look good, and the team is still, the team, the team is still working on different like particle effects. And they were talking about like how like, oh yeah, we can improve the way, you know, you know, like you know, when people get shot, you know, in the chest and they're wearing body armor, how that looks. I'm like, god damn, you guys, jeez, calm down now. So, um, the team is still working hard and improving the game as much as they can. So I think, and so if you're looking, if you're really into tactical first-person shooters and you want to, and especially if you're a fan of like the, the old days of Ghost Recon and and Rainbow Six, this might it's worth checking out. Um, Edge of Space, get on it, get on it. If you're a fan of like, if you really, if you want to play like a, God, this is gonna sound way too over the top, but if you ever wanted to play Metroid and a Metroid RPG online, that's like that's that's, that's almost too much, but. Um, to me, that's that's what it comes. It comes close to it. I mean, it's the the art style, the, na the nature of the visuals, the 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 hardcore kind of like survival sandbox gaming. The, you can create your own bases and create your own defenses and your weapons. Tons and tons and tons of weapons. So it's, it's, I mean, I think when I talked to Jay Crane, the main developer, he said there were over like a billion weapon combinations. I'm like, I can't say a billion weapon, but it is, it's true, the math and everything. I'm like, I can't say a billion, but he claims there's a billion weapon combinations and the creatures are crazy cool. I mean, there's a laser shark, space laser sharks. That's all I gotta say. If you if you think that, by, that find that intriguing, check out Edge of Space. Especially get on now, especially since multiplayer is coming very soon. Okay, we're gonna keep a lookout for that, and you can find uh, coverage for those games eventually on 2DX.com. You could follow 2DX on Twitter, at 2DX. You could follow me, Tim Torres, at pleased to meet ya. That's you spelled Y-A at the end. And that's actually what Sakura says in Street Fighter 4, just to yes. tie uh, Street Fighter into this once more. Nice. And, well uh, done. Well played. Golf clap. <laughs> thank you. Um, Anthony, how can, we, how can we find you online? How can we follow you? Hell no! <laughs> you can't follow me. I don't. Uh, if you really, really want to follow me, I do have a Twitter. It's, it's not. It's not used very often, but it is called the Tao of Chow. That's T A O, O V C H A U. Um, if you really want to follow me, go ahead. Sure, check out my Twitter. I have been updated in almost like seven months, but sure. Um, otherwise, you see, you'll probably see a lot of my press releases because that's what I do. PR. 
we're at Reverb Communications. So, so yeah. Okay, Anthony, thank you so much for coming on and talking about Game Fan, Insurgency, Edge of Space, and uh, you're damn right. You better be thankful. It's I'm me. So thankful. It's me. I'm and I'm sure we would love to have you come back on. I'm Jeffrey, who's a big SNK Neo Geo fan. You know the golden age of gaming. If you want to come back on and talk about that, we would love to have you. You know what? You tell him to jump on Xbox and on, on this Xbox 360. You tell him to power up Samurai Showdown 2. And if he can play, if he can beat me in Samurai Showdown 2, maybe I'll consider coming back. Okay, you let him know. That. Okay. All right, Jeff. The gauntlet has been thrown. <laughs> <laughs> thrown down. Everyone else, thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you again.